good morning everybody and to begin with the today's session of neuroophthalmology we will start with the anatomy of the afferent visual pathway visual sensory system as we all know is an highly specialized feature of human brain the optic nerves per se comprise around 40% of all together combined optic uh, axons of all the cranial nerves whereas the visual uh, processing uh, areas take around take over around 55% of the cortical area whenever a patient comes with complaints of diminution of vision whether it may be because of ophthalmological emergencies or chronic insidious nature uh, disorders precise localization along the neural axis of vision takes prime importance it's a challenging job with thorough clinical history general and neurological ophthalmological examination with the aid of right imaging and ophthalmological tests these give us a whole lot of information and knowledge anatomical knowledge of all this visual axis is important for making a correct diagnosis in today's next 30 minutes we will be going ahead from the cornea the anterior part traveling along the visual axis to reach up to the cortex so coming anteriorly this is the anterior eye as seen onto the slit lamp the air tear interface itself helps for major focusing of the light rays more than the lens as well like this humor is translucent the iris and the pupillary aperture the lens shape is uh, maintained by the ciliary muscles for focusing of the light rays onto the visual axis the depth and shape of uh, different objects or the images is perceived by the relative size difference as projected onto the corresponding size points of the retina the image however as seen is inverted onto the retina the corresponding visual halves of the right and left hemispheres will be projected onto the contralateral primary visual area and the associate areas wherein the image is still inverted on thereafter being transferred to the association areas which will reinvert the image and the image is perceived as a real one as we know the retina has different layers as seen on the optical coherence tomography however this is the superficial transparent nerve fiber layer then the ganglion cell layers axons of which will be converging and forming the optic fiber uh, optic nerve coming to the fundus examination with the ongoing covid pandemic use of face shields goggles social distancing i'm not sure how far we will be practicing fundus evaluation but the recent future maybe fundus photography can aid in this important evaluation this is the natural uh, the normal uh, fundus as seen by the uh, examiner the right and the left eyes of the patient the optic uh, the retinal vessels fanning out towards the temporal end the center optic disc is the point where the ganglion cell layer axons will converge has no photoreceptors and is termed as blind spot also known as blind spot of mariosch center of which is a cup shaped depression the normal size is 0.3 to 0.5 compared to the disc this is an example of a normal cup a slightly larger this is the disc and the center cup like this uh, depression as against a small cup this is the barely uh, perceptible central depression this is the disc at risk at risk of ischemic optic neuropathies temporal to this will be macula densely packed with cones and responsible for the precision of central vision center of which is fovea again dense the most highest density of cones has no rods no capillaries that's why seen as dark the choroidal vasculature is seen through so the normal fundus coming down to some central abnormalities uh, bilateral disc edema with central raised eye ct is known as papillary edema which has been graded by prison into five stages the grade 1 wherein a c shaped halo is seen sparing the temporal rim grade 2 wherein the circumferential disc margin blur are blurred grade 3 wherein, wherein the branches of retinal arteries will be obscured grade 4 a major retinal vein the superior or inferior retinal or temporal arteries will be blurred and grade 5 wherein most of the major arteries or and veins will be blurred and there will be some splinter hemorrhages at the disc margins commonly no seen other abnormality optic disc pallor as seen against the normal disc the cherry red spot which is common commonly seen in central retinal artery occlusion the pale retina and the central fovea which reflects the choroidal vasculature another commonly asked question in exams 
hard and soft exudates. Soft exudates, rightly known as cotton wool spots, are fluffy white shadows, which are in fact superficial nerve fiber layer impacts because of occlusions of the superficial capillaries and arterioles. These are distributed along circumferential along the optic disc. As against hard exudates are nothing but lipid rich exudates into the intraretinal layers and predominantly seen along the retina and surrounding the macula. Types of retinal hemorrhages, there are superficial, first two are the superficial retinal, the hemorrhages seen in the nerve fiber layer. Both are typically characterized by a point of origin starting and from where the hemorrhage feathers out, fans out peripherally. When seen on the retina, this is, and these are termed as flame-shaped hemorrhages seen in hypertensive retinopathy, diabetic retinopathies. When seen at the optic disc margins, these are known as splinter hemorrhages. Deep into the retina, rupture of the venules or capillaries, deeper capillaries causes circumscribed, well circumscribed dot blot hemorrhages. And anterior to or some, on the interface between the vitreous and the retina is the subhaloid. The hemorrhage showing a fluid level, D-shaped subhaloid hemorrhage, commonly associated with intracranial hemorrhages, especially subarachnoid hemorrhage, where it is termed as Tursen syndrome. Optic disc edema need not always be associated with optic neuri neuritis. This is an interesting case wherein a 36-year-old lady presented with left frontal headache, left eye diminution of vision, associated with painful eye movements. Early on, the examination revealed disc edema. Her MRI was normal and CSF had shown proteins and lymphocytes. She had had no imp imp improvement with steroids and vision progressively deteriorated. Three weeks later, when the optic disc edema had finally settled down, a macular star was apparent, clinching the diagnosis of neuroretinitis, a condition with optic disc as well as surrounding neural retinal inflammation. Commonest causes are infectious in India, tuberculosis, fungal, salmonella, syphilis, in West, Bartonella Hensley. Inflammatory conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, periarthritis, neurosa can still be associated. However, 25% of the cases, no cause is apparent and that's termed as idiopathic. Hypertension, renal retinopathy can also mask out with typical uh, presentation. A clinical point of importance, macular star. Why this characteristic steelate pattern? The, after the peripapillary uh, nerve uh, inflammation, the exudates from the capillaries traverse through the retinal layers. The penetrate and the lipid rich exudates are held at the up, no, outer plexiform layer. Aqueous phase, however, passes through. And these lipid rich exudates are deposited along the papillomacular bundle and fibers, giving rise to the typical star like appearance called as macular star. Coming down to the blood supply of retina and optic disc, the ICA, internal carotid artery, gives a first branch, the ophthalmic artery. First branch of this is the central retinal artery. The central retinal artery penetrates the optic nerve inferiorly, travels within the substance of the optic nerve, and then emerges at the optic disc, where it divides into the superior and the inferior, temporal and nasal branches, four major subdivisions. The rest of the ophthalmic artery continues and supply, gives short posterior ciliary arteries, which form the circle of zin, which supplies the optic nerve head, and the long posterior ciliary arteries, which thereafter continue to provide vas choroidal vasculature and the iris vasculature. The rest of the ophthalmic artery gives branches to racrimer gland and the extraocular movements and orbital structures. Corresponding veins drain via the valveless communications, ultimately coming into cavernous sinus, therefore posing pathway for infections to and from orbit. Clinical point of importance for blood supply of retina, presence of a cilioretinal artery. This is seen in around 15 to 20% of the population. It is mainly arising from choroidal vasculature and is seen distinctly arising away from the central retinal artery on the optic disc. Importance, it helps in preserving the macular perfusion during central retinal artery occlusion. The circle of zin, which we saw earlier, the anastomosis formed by the short posterior ciliary arteries, which supply the optic nerve head, inherently again have watershed zones between the lateral, medial and the lateral uh, branches and the superior and the inferior ciliary branches. These watershed zones are the ones which are responsible for causing altitudinal field effects characteristically seen in the ischemic optic neuropathy. But again, altitudinal field effect need not always be ischemic optic neuropathy as seen. This is a case of 65-year-old gentleman, a hypertensive and an old history of stroke already on aspirin and statins had presented initially with inferior blurring of vision. 
At presentation, it was predominantly the nasal quadrant. Still on statins and antiplatelets, the vision, however, continued to deteriorate. At three weeks, it was almost complete in interior hemifield vision loss. A MRI at this point, T2, uh, sorry, T1 fat suppressed and contrast enhanced showed an optic uh, uh, meningioma compressing the optic nerve at the optic canal. Thus, highlighting the importance of imaging in cases wherein the progressive course may not be confirming with the initial diagnosis. Coming back to the anatomy of optic nerve, the ganglion cell fibers have converged at the optic nerve head, the intraocular portion of the optic nerve, travel backwards into the intraorbital section, which is a tortuous course. And herein, the nerve sheath is associated, is attached to the surrounding extraocular muscles, responsible for the painful eye movements in optic neuritis. Backwards, it travels through the optic canal, the intracanalicular portion, and then in, enters intracranially to converge with the contralateral side at the optic chasm. Structurally, the dura and subarachnoid membrane will be attached posteriorly to the optic canal and anteriorly merged with the sclera. Subarachnoid space containing CSF and the pile blade layers are continuous intracranially. The posterior ciliary arteries give segmental branches and subpile plexus, which supply the distal portion of the optic nerve. Characteristic and uh, importance of these anatomical subparts will be seen in differential involvement in optic neuritis. As seen in NMOST, uh, it involves predominantly the posterior nerve, uh, optic nerves along with the chiasma. Mock associated optic neuritis, however, is classically seen to involve the entire course of the optic nerve along with papillitis, which can be seen as hyperintensity, even diffusion restriction in the MRIs, along with inflammation of the optic nerve sheath causing perineuritis. Multiple sclerosis, however, is associated with short segmental involvement. Coming back from optic nerves into the optic chiasma, the crossing over. It is best seen in sagittal section, uh, in the coronal section, wherein a flat dumbbell-shaped structure is seen lying anterior to the pituitary stalk over the pituitary gland, the spinodal sinuses beneath, flow words of the internal carotid artery on the sides, and up uh, superiorly, the third slit of third ventricle. In few cases, most of the cases, this is uh, overlying just above the diaphragma cellae. However, in some cases, it can be anteriorly shifted known as prefixed chiasma, or as posteriorly over the dorsum ciliae, called as postfixed chiasma. The fiber tag arrangement, the nasal fibers from the optic nerve traverse, cross over to the contralateral side, then again loop anteriorly into the contralateral optic nerve, and thereafter join the ipsilateral nasal fibers to con continue as optic tract. This anterior loop is known as Wilbrand's knee, responsible for the typical junctional scotoma. Anatomical existence of which is, however, a matter of debate. Few people have uh, described this to be an artifactual observation seen in enucleated specimens. Asymmetric ch chiasmal compressions can lead to RAPD. Coming up to the blood supply of chiasma, it, is, it has a rich vascular supply located within the circle of villus with internal carotid arteries on both sides, the posterior communicating arteries traversing or crossing the optic uh, tracts anterior cerebral arteries anteriorly and the anterior communicating artery. This rich vascular supplies can at times be detrimental wherein we had a case. This was a 32 year old male who had present uh, a known hypertensive had presented with progressive right more than left vision loss. MRI initially showed a huge aneurysmal right ACA, ICA uh, dilation compressing the chiasma and the right optic nerve. On CT angiography, he revealed dolipectasias with diffuse dilation of bilateral ICS, including the vertebral artery and the basilar artery. Compressive lesions of uh, this, this type typically present with a fundus picture called as bota atrophy. This is another case wherein a 12 year old boy had a similar supracellular uh, craniopharyngioma, which was compressing the chiasma and the right optic nerve. This is the fundus picture. The right optic nerve compression has caused almost complete right optic atrophy. Left eye, however, showed predominantly the nasal and the retinal uh, temporal nerve fiber layer thinning, wherein, whereas the superior and the inferior part is relatively maintained. This horizontal shape uh, cupping or else the band, at, uh, band atrophy is the classic finding of compressive lesions at the optic chiasma or optic tracts. Coming back to the optic tract, the fibers 
of the corresponding retinal hemispheres travel along the optic tracts and converge onto the lateral geniculate body. A smaller route is given to the extra geniculate fibers going onto the pretectal nucleus. Compression of optic tract can cause homonymous visual field defects or RAPD. This is another case, one of Sir's favorite. I'm sure he's still having the MRI in his cabin. A 35-year-old lady presented with bilateral sequential loss of vision a month's duration. She had bilateral optic atrophy, pallor on examination. MRI, however, showed atrophic, thinned out optic nerve, chiasma, and hyperintensities tracking along the optic tracts. This is the anatomical correlate. You can see the optic tract traversing uh, 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 ahead of the cerebral peduncles of the midbrain, the red nucleus. These go and converge at this precise location, which is lateral geniculate body. This is a part of thalamus and the first relay station of visual pathway. Any lesions anterior to lateral geniculate body will be causing RAPD and optic nerve atrophy. Anything posterior to this spares the pupil and optic disc. This is the anatomical demarcation of anterior and posterior pathway. Clinically, however, chiasma marks the anterior and posterior pathway, wherein the anterior ones present monocular or unilateral field defects, and the posterior ones have bilateral. Lateral geniculate body, again, has retinotopic field arrange fiber arrangements. The hilar ones receive maximum macular fibers. Anatomical point of interest here, the blood supply of lateral geniculate body. It derives a dual blood supply. Anterior choroidal artery arising from the internal carotid artery and posterior choroidal artery arising from the posterior cerebral artery. Together, anastomose supplying dual supply at the macular fibers at the hilum. This is an interesting case a Latin, uh, of lateral geniculate body involvement, wherein a 42 year old psoriatic lady on treatment with methotrexate had presented with recurrent bouts of vomiting with sudden loss of bilateral vision. And MRI had shown isolated lateral geniculate body involvement seen as hyperintensities on the flare, diffusion restriction on the DWI, and subtle hyperintensities noted on the T1 as well, termed as uh, hemorrhagic impacts of both the lateral geniculate bodies. Till date, there have been around nine reports of isolated bilateral gen lateral geniculate body involvement. If you are lucky enough to see one, do write it up. Another interesting case, hemorrhage into the lateral geniculate body produces a characteristic visual field effect called as quadruple sector anopia, wherein the upper and lower sectoral field effects are seen in a homonymous uh, visual field. Coming to the extra geniculate pathways, as we had seen initially, 10% of the optic fibers go on to the superior particular, which govern the head movements, pretectal nuclei, which will be make mediating the bilateral pupillary reflex, and suprachiasmatic nucleus, which mediates the circadian rhythm. Coming back from the lateral uh, geniculate body, optic radiations. These are the second order neurons from lateral geniculate body, sparing the pupil and optic disc as we saw initially. They travel around the posterior uh, limb of internal capsule and form anterior tempo, uh, temporal loop of fibers called as Meyer's loop and parietal fibers. The temporal loop, loop of fibers can be affected in patients undergoing anterior temporal lobectomies and present with superior quadrant, quadrantinopia seen as even sectoral defects. These fibers are diffusely oriented. So the fiber means field defects may not be symmetrical in both the hemispheres, although homonymous, they, they are relatively incongruous or symmetrical. Ultimately, coming down to the visual cortex, as seen on the MRI, the parietal, superior parietal lobule, precuneus, separated by the parietal occipital sulcus, occipital lobe, which is divided by the calcarine sulcus into cuneus and lingula. This is variously being termed as triad cortex, type of generic calcarine cortex, characteristically because there is a thin white line seen traveling along just parallel to the gray matter. These are the myelinated fibers of the layer core responsible for precise visual processing. The center uh, of optic pole, uh, of hospital pole receives maximum number of macular fibers are most comprising almost around 50 to 60% of the visual cortex area, which is responsible for only the central 10% of the visual field, thereby causing precision in the visual acuity by a phenomenon called as cortical magnification. Being so important, it again receives dual blood supply, rest of the occipital lobe being supplied by the PCA, optic pole receiving another supply from MCA territory as well. The associated areas, just to simplify, from the primary visual field V1, the ventral stream, mainly V2, V3 areas, which are uh, related to object identification, color and shape discrimination, 
the what path pathway and the superior or the dorsal stream which is mainly related to motion recognition and special processing a few interesting cases there was a 71 year old male who was brought with insidious history of irrelevant behavior bumping into people not recognizing his own relatives assuming a strangers to be his relatives and talking to them ct however showed bilateral infarcts pca infarcts the left one being chronic and the right subacute to acute infarct their back pre pre presenting a prototype of anton syndrome for of frontal blindness now imagine the same thing happening in a child this was an 8 year old child with, presented with refractory epilepsy following post neonatal hypoxia clinically however this child was visually completely independent for his activities this is the importance of neuronal plasticity shifting of the visual areas after initial or early neonatal injury this could be demonstrated in another case this child was actually cooperative enough for functional imaging the left side showed occipital damage post hypoxic injury in the neonatal stage and the visual entire visual uh, activation area was shifted onto the right occipital lobe why so much prediction for the posterior cortex during the hypoxic ischemic injuries reason anatomically this posterior cortices compared to the anterior are earlier to myelinate these early myelinating neurons thereby being susceptible for hypoxic injury also compared to the anterior ones the posterior cortices have high density of nmda receptors making them prone for glutamate excitotoxicity <clears throat> another reason posterior cortex has high catecholamine receptors therefore highlighting presence of uh, involvement predominant involvement of the posterior cortex in conditions like rcvs and press posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome thus dear all we have reached our destination and the journey has come to an end with visual cortex remember literature patients teachers everyone will give us their own angle of presentation it's the concepts are the ones we will have to decipher ourselves bonus points will be given to people who identify the name of this diagram 